In these videograms, Arthur Negus and I will be telling the story of the development of English furniture from its very beginnings to the present day. Our aim really is to show that there is much more to furniture than meets the eye and understanding more about it greatly adds to the pleasure of using it and having it in your own home. We'll also be explaining some of the nuances of design and detail so that you'll be able to date furniture and tell the all-important difference between the original and the fake or the copy. And as each period goes by, we'll also be seeing something of the social and historical background as the skill of the English craftsman developed. So let's go back in time now to the medieval and Elizabethan period to start the story of English furniture. And what better place could there possibly be to begin the series of programmes on English furniture than here in an English wood amidst the raw material? The oak. And deeper into the wood, there's beech and elm and ash and chestnut and holly, the very woods which were indigenous to this country and which the early craftsmen, the carpenters and joiners, used to practice and perfect their skills. And it was those skills that lay the foundation for the masterpieces in the golden age of English cabinet making. Well, all old furniture was, of course, once new, and before it could be made, trees had to be felled and sawn and split, and they would have used a saw pit such as this, in use indeed in the English countryside for centuries. Every community would have had one, and it was probably in constant use. And if hard labour requires definition, then this is probably it. Now, the top sawyer standing up here had little more to do than guide the saw through the wood. It was the poor bottom sawyer down there below in the pit who had to use all his muscle on the important downward cuts. There is indeed probably no single job in the whole furniture making process less enviable than that of bottom sawyer. It was hot, it was back breaking and he had the added unpleasantness of all the sawdust from the timber tumbling down on top of him. But of course, before you needed furniture to sit on or eat from, you had to have a roof over your head. And it was in the construction of timber frame buildings like this one that the first rules and skills of joinery, later to be used, of course, in the making of furniture, came to be acquired. And it wasn't long before a simple but highly effective method of joining timbers together evolved. And here we have a fine example of it, a tie beam and crown post joined together by means of the mortis and tenon, the male and the female, bound together naturally without use of glue or nails or any kind of foreign body. The mortis here in the horizontal and the tenon here in the upright. And as we shall see, this uh, was the beginning of the art of the joiner and uh, whoever made this piece was a very effective joiner indeed because it was cut out some 500 years ago and it still fits together perfectly. It's very difficult so long afterwards for us to imagine what life was like in medieval times. That is, until you find a door like this one into the past and walk through it. An earth floor, a central fireplace, a table for meals, a bench facing the fire with your back to the wall for support. The furniture in a medieval house such as this, probably made of oak, taken from trees which were grown undoubtedly not very far away. Well, perhaps the commonest form of early English furniture is a three-legged stool like this. It's um, splayed legs coping very adequately with the uneven floor, doweled right through and pinned from the top. As popular now in design as it was a thousand years ago. 
But perhaps the most useful piece of furniture in the medieval house was the chest. It was used for storage of all kinds uh, at a time when security and keeping things dry must have been a constant problem. But it wasn't only used as a chest. It could be a table, a bench, or even a bed. Hello. Well, I suppose uh, I'm looking and you're looking at one of the earliest primitive forms of chests that one could find in this country, because it is nothing more than a tree trunk. You can see a tree trunk has been squared up a bit. You see in the end there a cross section of the trunk of the tree, and you notice it's got wrought iron bands across it to sort of hold it together better. Notice also in the front, because this contained practically all a man had, five iron lock plates. Necessary that all five people, for security reasons, were here at the same time when something needed to be removed. And I'll just show you what it looks like underneath. Great heavy log of wood, really. And that is the first type of chest called a dugout chest. But here is a pretty little article called an ark. Um, here, you, now you saw who pick out the easy job on that saw pit. Well, this was made before saws, and uh, it, th th these planks of wood here are what we call riven. That meant to say they were split. You can see they've all been split down this ray, which we call a medullary ray, which is perhaps better known as uh, silver grain. And uh, there they are, they've been split with a beetle and wedge. And uh, you notice no ironwork on this at all. A pin hinge to revolve this cover and uh, the ends uh, mortised right through and held with a little wooden peg. But that is an arc. You know, we use all sorts of names for these things. We call them chests and coffers and all sorts. But this one's got what we call slab ends. You notice, again, thick, not much construction about it, but we're very early. And you notice here in these very early ones, these huge wide styles. This thing, although it goes right down to form the legs, the width of this is really quite enormous on a chest just that size. Here's a little more of a standard type. Now this chest, this type of chest was made right up into the 18th century. Who doesn't know these are salt boxes? And uh, it's just interesting to show it's just made simply of planks. But here, really, for the first time is a coffer. Now, we use this word coffer for anything these days, but this truly is a coffer. All coffers had arch tops, mainly to get rid of the wet, probably. Uh, they were all iron-bound, and iron-bound over leather. Here, obviously, the leather's all gone, but this is a beautiful example of what we call a trussing coffer, because with these heavy wrought iron handles, this carried a man's possession on horseback, more or less wherever he went. And so that's a nice article, all around about 1500 here. And for coming up to 1500 here, two Gothic chests, one bit ordinary, one superb. Absolutely superb. When you think of the age of this, uh, in solid walnut, big thick top once more, beautiful carved panels in the front there, with the owner's probably heraldic device there, below that uh, wrought iron lock plate. But a rattling good chest, that. And I keep on saying it, bear in mind the date, because it's no good going out looking for these. You, you won't find these bits. We should get to more to bits of furniture we're more used to seeing, like this. Now, this is the form every box or coffer now takes. It's usually got uh, narrow styles. You remember the wide ones over there. Panelled fronts, calves, got uh, mask heads, all sorts of things. Carrier tied trusses, all sorts of things. But basically, this is the form right through now onwards. And it's only recognising the different details. It's the detail of everything which allows one to date it. This box, this coffer, is standing back to front because it's most unusual, in my experience, to find one which is panelled all round. This one has been made to stand out in a room. This is the back, all the way around, just the same, these nice linen fold panels. Everyone knows what a linen fold panel is. Supposed to represent the folds of linen in an upright position. 
And uh, here again you have these things, mortised and tenant and pinned, and the panels were put in with a little bit of play so that uh, there was no warping when, as the thing expanded or contracted, so the panels could just move and be all right. Here's another funny little panel worth just showing there. See, linen fold again, all punched through with holes. And obviously this is from a food cupboard, an odd panel out of a food cupboard where it was necessary to punch holes all through the panel doors, all through the ends, in order to get some circulation of cold air to try and keep some of the food fresh. Well, now there's a few examples of early chests. In fact, one might say very early chests, because you must remember that we're no farther advanced than about 1525 with this particular linenfold one. Well, a lot of this early English furniture was made for the church. The small parish churches, the great cathedrals, the monasteries and the nunneries. The church was a tremendous patron of those early English craftsmen and as a result had a great uh, influence on the design of early English furniture. Notice, for instance, no upholstery. Well, that doesn't appear for another 200 years or so into the 17th century. You see, upholstery was to provide comfort and comfort, the ascetics thought, had no place in the worship of God. And so there was no upholstery in these early English pieces. Well, now here's a little curiosity from those uh, medieval churches. These, which were commonplace at the time, were known as misericords, and they were really a perch. They were made so that the elderly and the infirm could uh, rest their bottoms in here, while at the same time having all the appearance of standing up. But they weren't just used by the elderly and the infirm. Many a lazy preacher perched on a misericord. And they're interesting to us today, not simply because of the stories that are told about them, but because of the enormous wealth and variety uh, of the carving. And the craftsmen who were working for the church at this time saw all this not simply as an act of decoration, but as a real contribution to Christian worship. Now, there was at this time also a cross-fertilization between the ideas that were used in architecture and the ideas in furniture. And so the furniture reflects architectural ideas, the Gothic idea, summed up completely by this bench end or pew end, and so too in these uh, timbers, which were originally part of a choir stool, and they date from about uh, 1400. And this lectern over here is early too, but there's a problem about uh, some of this furniture in saying precisely whether it's English or French. This could easily, for instance, have come out of a church in Normandy. There was a considerable amount of trade going on between ports on the south coast of England and the northern coast of Europe, France in particular, and that had been going on, of course, since pre-Roman times. But it was Henry VIII who did more than anybody to expand that trade. He was very keen on the idea of trade and commerce uh, with the continent. He encouraged it, and as a result, uh, one of the greatest influences of all came to bear on English craftsmanship. It was the Renaissance, to have uh, a most profound effect on everything that our craftsmen did. And these are a fine example of the sort of influences that were brought to bear. These medallion heads, which you found on wall panelling at the time, and they were also introduced into furniture. Over here, a, a good example of that. This uh, chest dates from the time of Henry VIII. There is the medallion incorporated into it, pure Italian design influence, and that uh, form of decoration became known as Remain work. Well, now to move back in time very slightly to uh, 1485 and the end of the Wars of the Roses. Now, that really is a date worth remembering because wars, particularly civil wars, have a very unsettling effect on the whole process of art and design and invention. You see, people are uncertain about the future, uncertain whether they're still going to be around in a year or so's time. But once the Wars of the Roses were out of the way, then changes began to develop because people became more certain about the future. A new era of expansion and prosperity was beginning. There were changes not only in furniture, but also in our houses. Let's have a look at some of them. The medieval hall with its central half was giving way to long galleries with a variety of apartments opening off. And there were other changes too. Fireplaces with chimneys now became established in the wall. And by Elizabethan times, the walls themselves were often decorated with panelling. Tapestries were another popular wall covering. The demand for more luxurious furnishings inevitably brought with it increasing variety. 
Chairs, cupboards, four-poster beds and dining tables all began to develop quickly. One feature that we particularly associate with the Elizabethan period came again from the continent, the bulbous turning which was introduced from Flanders. At first it was retained as the plain Flemish bulb, but it clearly provided the perfect vehicle for the English carver to practice his art, and the result was the development of the deeply carved cup and cover, as it's called. So by the second half of the 16th century, English furniture, having absorbed uh, so many design influences from abroad, was uh, beginning to develop its own distinct identity. That's quite true, Hugh, and uh, as you know well, uh, types of workmen were even quarrelling amongst themselves what they should do, like turners and joiners. Here is a stool, a nice Elizabethan stool, the usual turn legs that one finds on these joint stools, and bear in mind these are the first things that people sat on to eat off, but when you find one with a nice big bold carving all around it, and these great carbuncles all around the frieze, then you can say my words a nice stool, because that is. And of course, as is generally known, there were really only stools in houses, very, very few chairs, chairs like this, one or two, kept for the very VIP and his host, not much more. This is interesting because here is a, a big spray of flowers or a tree in which you can clearly see has been dug out. Quite the opposite to market tree, which is laid on the top, but dug out and these holes and these designs filled with bog oak and holly. And this one is very similar, not much difference in the date, smothered in carving. It got an arched top panel which uh, was liked at this time very much indeed. Here's an old favourite of mine. I love this type of chair, but I can't think of anything much more uncomfortable. Tiny little triangular soap seat, probably crib from Scandinavia. A mass of turning at the back, sometimes called a throne chair, not where the Queen would sit on, but thrown in the sense of a, of a man throwing a vase in pottery. A turned or thrown chair, and my word, that's not just been cleaned to come in this studio. Someone has looked after that for many, many, many years. And here's a chair again, not quite like it started, I think. Italian design here with this crossover frame. Here there would be no wood showing at all. Uh, it would be tightly stuck on the red silk damask or the velvet all over. So it became just a, a covered X-frame chair and uh, well, there's a certain amount of comfort there because there'll be two or three cushions on the webbing on the seat. And here, you can remember a few moments ago, we talked about the linen fold panel chest. There's almost one there where a man has said, well, let's make it a bit more comfortable. People sit on them, put two very crude arms and just a bit of linen fold, carved linen fold panelling at the back. So turns in his mind a chest into a settle. And these things were beginning to happen. So was this. Here's a chest I've known for many years. It stands in the hall at Barclay Castle. It's called Drake's Chest. Nothing about it except it's made in cypress wood. Again, probably from Italy. A lovely wood, this. Has the properties of dispelling moth and beetles and everything else. You could put rich vestments in here, rich gowns, and they'd be kept free. And this has got just a simple plain top, but because the thing has been shut for so many years, this lovely painting underneath here, all these beautiful men of war, where you can nearly see them, you know, the armada steaming up the channel. But that is a beautiful bit underneath there. And here's a cupboard, known today as a court cupboard, probably a misnomer because a cupboard at this time was a cup board. It was a plain board on which cups stood, and they sometimes came in one and two tiers, still on which cups stood, with no cupboards at all. And later, then, you get a little cupboard, as it were, cocked in here. Sometimes they go up with pillars and you get more cupboards, but it's 50 to 100 years before you get a cupboard completely enclosed by doors. This one's rather nice, called a court cupboard, but there is this little uh, business about knowing exactly what is the right word to call it. And here is a non-such chest. Yes, if you guessed it was, you're absolutely right. 
any sort of chest in England of this age which is inlaid with architectural marquetry like that immediately is called a non-such chest in memory of that uh, non-such palace built by Henry VIII at Cheam. It's believed really by most people, and I believe that to be quite true, that it is just a, 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 some architectural marquetry more than a, a, a drawing, as it were, of this palace. Because you've only got to see anything like this and you say, oh, the non-such palace. No such palace as this, said Henry VIII. And look, perhaps that is a, perhaps that is a bit of it, because there's a dear old chap's portrait. So, we've talked about nearly everything. In fact, the only one thing that we've never mentioned, of which there were many of, was beds. Look at this. A bed of about 1600, although uh, by the design of it, it certainly looks more to me like a bed of Henry VIII's time. You see, it has these curious straight posts cut, like they are there, and uh, the tester, the cornice, carved with vertical flutes around it. And the rest of the bed is then made up with panelling, quite small panels here, the headboard and the tester, all panelled. You notice the size of the panels, mortised and tended together, and pegged, but small panels. They get larger and larger in Queen Anne's time, but not now. And of course, this is not strictly speaking a four-poster. A four-poster bed is what it says up on four posts. This tester is supported on these two end posts and on the headboard. And later on comes in massive posts here with big bulbous supports. And t the, the headboard is reduced by quite half. And then two more posts are added and we get the later four-poster beds which run on right into the 18th century. And of course, not only would this bed be like this, but it would be completely covered. When anyone had gone to bed, they'd pull these heavy curtains round, great thick velvet curtains, keep out the draft on everyone else because it is a fact they were not all in bedrooms as such they were in large rooms almost all over the house and when you went in to something like this and really enclosed yourselves you were really on your own Arthur thank you very much well as you know you can't really talk about furniture and uh, beds in particular without mention of the great bed of Ware, which incidentally was referred to uh, by Sir Toby Belcher in a speech in Shakespeare's Twelfth Night there it is, and it really is some bed. It's uh, 10 feet 8 inches wide, it's 11 feet long, and it's said it could accommodate eight couples at the same time. However, we won't go into that. But if you'd like to see the bed for yourself, it's at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and well worth looking at, not only because it's unique uh, through its size, but also because it's typical of the marvellous boldness of expression of the Elizabethan period. <laughs> Now, the period between the accession of James I and the establishment of the Commonwealth under Cromwell in 1649 is normally referred to in English furniture as Jacobean. So let's begin then with the early years of the 17th century. The reign of James I saw a movement away from the elaborate decoration of Elizabethan times and towards simpler lines and greater comfort. And it really is from this time onwards that you begin to find upholstery in English furniture as we would recognise it today. Now, this particular chair is from the early years of the 17th century. It's still, remarkably, covered in its original velvet. But this wasn't a common chair, even uh, in the 17th century. It was uh, owned by a wealthy man. A little later in the period, this chair and this particular form of uh, decoration and covering is known as turkey work, and it takes that name uh, directly from its influence, which was, of course, uh, Turkish carpets. And then throughout history, um, styles of dress were influencing the design of furniture. Now, this kind of chair was made to accommodate the voluminous skirts worn by fashionable ladies of the period. And it's since become known as the farthingale chair. Incidentally, don't be put off by this uh, covering. That was obviously done much later. Well, the English uh, furniture makers of the period certainly weren't lacking in imagination. This became known as the monk's bench, but that doesn't even begin to describe it. You see, it's so many pieces of furniture in one. A bench, yes, with a straight back, but lift up the seat and it becomes a chest, storing things, and then this back is deceptive too, because it very quickly turns itself into a table. It wasn't even used by monks. But the craftsmen of the 17th century had greatly improved their techniques 
since medieval times. And the craft and trade guilds not only protected the special skills of their members, but they also carried out very strict tests to make sure that their standards were maintained. The work of the Turner is of particular significance in the 17th century. Those massive bulbous supports of Elizabethan times, often in the form of the elaborately carved cup and cover like this, well, these were now being thinned down. And at the same time, they were losing their carved decoration. In many cases, they became virtually plain pillar supports. As the century progressed, however, the Turners developed and perfected all sorts of variations, and eventually, in the second half of the 17th century, the attractive spiral turning was developed that today we call the barley sugar twist. Now, the vital piece of equipment for the Turner was, of course, his lathe, and the kind that was in common use for centuries, both before and after this period, was the pole lathe. The turner would invariably work out in the woods and forests with the raw material to hand, as the pole lathe was eminently suitable for turning new or green wood. A variety of small hand tools would be used to cut, split, and prepare the timber for turning. Stuart King is one of the few craftsmen to have mastered once more the techniques which virtually died out only 30 or 40 years ago. All the tools he uses were doing their job long before he was born. The pole lathe itself is very simple. A cord attached at one end to a foot treadle and at the other to a springy pole is twisted once around the piece of wood before it's centered between the lathe pockets which hold it in place. Every time the treadle is pressed and released, the wood rotates backwards and forwards and the cutting is done on the downward stroke when the work rotates towards the chisel. A fork between two tree branches makes an excellent fulcrum for the pole itself. A carefully chosen springy bough, often of larch. The heavier end is, of course, anchored to the ground. Using two or three different sized gouges, the work is soon brought to a rough shape. But great care has to be taken to keep the cord away from the cutting area, as it's all too easily severed. And finally, a broad, flat-bladed chisel is used to produce a smooth finish before the embellishments are added. When you see how efficient it is in the hands of an expert, it's perhaps not so surprising that such an apparently crude arrangement as the pole lathe stood the test of time so well. It was extremely portable, could produce turned items of high quality, and in the right hands its productivity could be quite staggering. Four or five hundred chair legs like this could be made in a week by a skilled turner. Quite remarkable that, isn't it? So simple and yet so very clever. And this is what they turned, of course. Here's a good example. Not only the leg, but coming right through the square to form the uprights of the arms. And this, a nice, simple, but a, just a nice chair. Solid seat, solid panel back, all the same as we've seen before, except this one has a date, which is original, 1612, and that makes that nice. But sort of viewing these two, do you get the idea this one's all skimpy and all something's the matter with it and when you look at it you begin to see because on all old bits of furniture here no change whatever in the colour this has been knocked about bruised and come through many years no change at all but look at this here you see look at this arm is a beautiful arm for showing how wrong it is black as ink up here well, it's all been stained black this was stained black as well still stays in the bit of carving on the arm but look where it's been used all gone you can't rub off age that's not possible so this chair must be relatively modern a copy and if you look in detail at it and one needs to look in detail at everything everywhere there are white lines and white edges all along the top all along there all along the front and you can see where they rested some feet on it Look at that, advertising the fact beyond any doubt whatever that that is a copy. Not so with this fella, because no white edges here, 
plenty of square edges to look. The hutch, a bread hutch, a food hutch, everything in this top half pierced. The door, of course, with open spindles, the arcading pierced right through, whole idea of getting air in. Pierced all through the corners, pierced all down the sides. The number one refrigerator, if you like, the only means they had of trying to get a little air in to save their food from going putrid. Nice hanging hutch, that, absolutely untouched. And these boxes are simple. Bible boxes, people call them. I like to think a Bible box is more of a flat, rectangular thing. Because well, they could have got a Bible in here, it's got some little drawers. The feature here is all contained in the front. There you see the former owner's initials, WF, not the maker, made especially for Mr. WF. Pretty little carved bit of anno, and look at those lovely figures there. One, six, five, seven. Look how nicely they're cut early and no white edges. And here's a smaller one still, which a lot of people might call a Bible box. I think a reading desk. Again, little drawers. This one's got a little special feature in it because they put all sorts of things in here, jewels and the lot. And there are two pegs inside there, which I've taken out in order to show you a secret drawer. See that, how nice that is? Look at that oak. There, just dirty with age, but unstained. No black stain. This is what old bits of furniture look like, because when these things were made, I have no doubt about it, they were absolutely brand new. You didn't have to stain them to make them look old. They were brand new. So was this in about 1650. See, the turner has been at it again. They were all raised on early turn legs, dressers like this, with no backs. None of this business of open shelves or paneled backs. This is the first type of dresser. And very nice they are, right? lovely bits of furniture. And here, I'll show you the way they make the drawer. Here, now they've learned to make these crude dovetails, which they show right through to the very front. And you can see there, there's been an applied piece of wood put on, which in point of fact was a molding worked on a bench. And they just put these moldings around like that, and that covered up those rather crude, funny-looking through dovetails. And when, when they got busy, and really got busy, look what they produced then. See, there is, here is the original piece of uh, moulding, just put on simply. Take no notice of the inlay for the moment, but look what they did when they mitered them. And look how they raised the middle panel, and look what they turned us. One deep drawer, just look at that. There's a drawer front. And the same arrangement down here on the cupboard doors, which enclose three long drawers like that. This is the first type of chest of drawers, round about 1650 again. And you notice the inlay, crude, mother of pearl and bone. And, oh, well, that's nicer still. There's actually the original date, 1658. And isn't that nice? That's a beautiful chest. And of course, it's so difficult to keep these things in strict order date-wise, because here we've got a Cromwellian chair and table, Credence table, with the usual sort of bold legs, and look at this for a chair. My word, some strength here. No pretty silk damask, no fear, not with Cromwell. Leather, brass nails. Well, there we are, just about up to the end of the Cromwellian period. Well, in 1660, the monarchy was restored and Charles II returned from the continent to a rapturous reception. He and his retinue in exile had become infused with the sparkle and gaiety of the courts of Europe and in particular, the opulence and splendor surrounding the French King Louis XIV. Well, this together with the general reaction of the public against the stern asceticism of the Commonwealth period provided really an ideal climate for the arts and crafts to flourish. And when you think of this period, you can't help associating it particularly with the diarists. And as regards furniture, it was John Evelyn who was the first writer to use the term cabinet maker, which he did as early as 1664. And of course, there was the even more famous Samuel Pepys, who was to make the first reference to bookcases as separate pieces of furniture. Now, this is one typical example of the earliest kind, the kind, in fact, that Pepys himself ordered from Simpson the joiner. And Pepys was a man far too fond of his money to spend it on mere passing fashions. 
Well, now, in talking about the development of English furniture, you can never really ignore what's going on in the world outside. The 17th century was to see a tremendous expansion of world trade. Over a hundred years previously, the Portuguese navigator Vasco da Gama had rounded the Cape of Good Hope, and he really started something. The seagoing merchant nations of Europe were in fierce competition with each other to establish trading stations in the Far East, in India, China, and Japan. And one company in particular was to have a really profound effect on the development of this trade with the Orient, and through that, the development of English furniture. It was in the ships of the East India Company that so many of the products of the East were brought back to England. Indeed, the company was set up for the very purpose of exploiting that trade, in competition particularly with the Dutch, who claimed exclusive rights in the East. It was regarded as so important that the company had been granted a monopoly on it by Royal Charter in 1600, and by 1614, the East India Company had 24 ships. But they were by no means just cargo carriers. They remained very much fighting vessels, and many an English East Indiaman lightened the load of Dutch vessels carrying similar cargoes back to Europe. It was as a result of this trade, for instance, that we started to import porcelain from China, hence the word China, which we still use commonly today. We also imported lacquered goods from, among other places, Japan, and the art of lacquering became known as Japaning. Although it's interesting that uh, because of a general lack of geographical knowledge, added to the fact that it was the East India Company that brought those goods back, the term India or India work was also commonly used. Well, these uh, Oriental influences, these Eastern styles of decoration, proved to be so popular that English craftsmen began to imitate them. And chinoiserie, as it's called, continued as a fashionable form of decoration throughout the 18th and into the 19th century. One uh, particularly attractive and most opportune idea that came from India was cane work, and it became popular largely because of that terrible disaster, the Great Fire of London in 1666. And it really was a disaster of mammoth proportions. More than 13,000 houses burnt to the ground, 200,000 people left homeless. In his account, Samuel Pepys describes everybody endeavouring to move their goods by flinging them into the river or bringing them into lighters that lay off. Nonetheless, of course, nearly all the furniture in those houses was destroyed. And so an active market grew up for a new and cheap kind of chair, and it was the Indian-inspired chair with the caned seat and back that provided the answer. It wasn't long before more ornate styles were developed, and the cane chair makers found themselves producing chairs and other seating furniture for some of the finest houses in England. Although production was based in London, it would seem that other chairmakers in the home counties soon began to follow the fashion, a fashion which lasted well into the 18th century. And, you know, people became attracted to these new style of chair, the cane seats and backs, how different they were from the rather massive, solid square panel back and solid seat. Now we get uh, the innovation of a new wood, more or less, that was always worn at about, but it's used r rather a lot in uh, Charles II's time. And uh, once more, no opportunity was lost in reminding people that the monarchy was back. Here is the top rail, you see, just pretty, little S-shaped scrolls, a crown in the middle. And always on this type of chair, there's a central stretcher down below there, where the same motif is repeated. So a nice armchair, nice Charles II single chair, where virtually not much difference, nothing much to say differently, except here we've got two little cherubs supporting the crown, and now, of course, just the same central stretcher running between those legs down there. You notice now also the backs get up, high backs, high back chairs, and this again in walnut, and once more, no crown here, but nevertheless, this curious motif here repeated down below, just as we now expect. And here's a dear little chair. These, ch these child's chairs are very rare, as you would expect. And here we have the same idea, crown, two cherubs. And uh, this is adjustable, this little footrest. One year old, two, three, four, five, six, right down to there. So you see, in use all the time. And look at that rail, I think that's beautiful. You can see this child all over these years, kicking, 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 smashed the crown, broke the cherub's heads off, but nice and round and smooth. Obviously been in use a long, long while. And uh, 
this needs repeating once more, I'd like to repeat it every time I come on television. No stain. This obviously is a replacement. There it is. You can see the black stain and you can see all the white edges down here. So that's been faithfully reproduced, but nevertheless is a replacement. Here's a new sort of thing that appeared. Um, this daybed, as it's called, <laughs> really a huge cane panel and a just adjustable head here, but only for about three or four inches. What I like about this are these lovely barley sugar twists. They appear before, but there's nothing like a Charles twist somehow or the other. It's so different to the modern twist of today. And you see, that's really all twist, as is this little table. And although there were smaller tables in Elizabethan and earlier times than this, it's really at this period that the families decided no longer to eat with their staff. In former days, they, they ate all round large refectory tables in the dining hall. But now they leave the staff, the staff go to their quarters and the family move into a small room, an eating room, a dining room, and it's necessary, of course, they have smaller tables. So little gate legs like this appear. And isn't that pretty? Just look how lively that all is underneath. See, all those twists and twisted rails, absolutely lovely, and all in walnut. That's a lovely walnut top. Bit unusual, a gate leg in walnut. They're nearly always in oak, such as this little fellow, possibly for tea. But you see the same idea here, bobbin turnings, but absolutely alive there. Really, one could sit and look at that and see all sorts of different ideas and patterns. Oh, we could sit and look at it for a long while. Mm -hmm. But that's how they came, and this is why this sort of table is much sought for. Here's a curious sort of thing called a coaching table. It has a narrow bed, something like a Sutherland table now, and, uh, of course, a deep flap. I think they used to run out with them when the coaches arrived at the coaching inns and just stuck them up like that. There is a gate that side, perhaps for drinks while they change horses. But they're coaching tables as ever was. And you see, there's a sort of a side table. Do you remember that Credence table with its straight edges? Now, curve lines. Furniture's beginning to bend a bit and people like it. And that just makes that pleasant. You see the stretcher not being straight, carries the shape of the top all round and makes a most attractive table. And here, well, no longer a writing box or if you like to say a large Bible box, but the first type of bureau. Little crude, nothing much inside, but early. Early because always the top overhangs. Now you see, the way this top, they've, they've, this table, it's all been made at the same time, but it overhangs the frame. And all bureaus around about this time, where you get them later on veneered in walnut and smothered in marquetry, they'll all have overhanging tops. And this interests me because obviously this, I should think, was made in the country somewhere, as against London, because basically it's all made in walnut, except that flap. And it seems to me this fellow hadn't got a wide enough plank of walnut wood to use, so he used elm. And he clamped it so it didn't warp. And uh, that just interests me, that it, and it's absolutely old. So it's just nice and a, well, it's gone a lovely colour. Before we look at some of the furniture of the reign of William and Mary, let's first put the period in historical perspective. In 1688, there was a revolution in England. It was brief, bloodless, and entirely successful. By the time it was over, James II had been deposed. Now, James had never really understood the English. He believed that he could force on them uh, Catholic supremacy. By the time he discovered his mistake, it was too late. 200 miles away from the seat of government down at Tor Bay in Devon, William of Orange had landed helped, he said, by a Protestant wind. The West Country rose to join him, and before long his supporters had gained control of the key cities in the Midlands and the North. James then settled matters by running away. The next spring, William and his wife Mary, who was incidentally James's daughter, were crowned as joint sovereigns. 
Now, with a Dutch king on the throne, it wasn't long before Dutch and German craftsmen, some of them expert cabinet makers, began to arrive in England. And they added to the influx of workmen from the continent, which had begun in 1685. In that year, Louis XIV repealed the Edict of Nantes, which had guaranteed religious toleration to the French Protestants, the Huguenots. And so, as a result, over 400,000 of them, most uh, skilled artisans, silversmiths, joiners, silk weavers, people like that, they left their homes and fled, some to Holland, Switzerland, a few to America, and many here to England. And English craftsmanship gained immeasurably from the skills they brought with them. The Baroque, which had dominated European art and architecture since the Renaissance, began to make stronger headway now in England. Its rather elaborate decoration seemed well suited to the grand houses and formal furniture of the new reign. One of the king's protégés was a man called William Blathwaite, who had been James II's Secretary of State for War and had served as a diplomat in Holland. Under William III, he returned to England to his old job at the War Office and married an heiress with an estate at Durham Park in Gloucestershire. He rebuilt the house, which still stands much as he left it on his death in 1710. And Arthur has been to see it. Well, here's the balcony room. I suppose one of my favourites. I'll tell you why a bit later. Look at the walls. You remember the Elizabethan square panelling covering all the walls and the doors and everything. All changed now. 1690, 1695. Long panels. Huge panels now, not the little square ones. Ionic columns. A Baroque influence here now with those heavy carved gilt capitals. A little cluster of columns around this fireplace, and the huge mouldings up above there. And not only did the walls or the panelling change, but so did legs once more. Legs of tables changed. And uh, here is a typical William and Mary leg, an umbrella-shaped leg, or an inverted cup-shaped leg, as some people prefer to call them. But here, for the first time, you get this type of leg. The clock is contemporary, has the usual little bullseye in the door and a square dial. You know, no arch dials before the 18th century. And uh, this is why I like it, just this book. This book and what's in the room, because here is an inventory which the housekeeper had to sign and did in fact sign in 1710, taking over and being responsible for everything in this house. And here it says, balcony room. A large black Japan tea table and two blacks. And there they are, look. Just fancy that. I suppose they've stood there just like that ever since that inventory was made and before. Here is the black Japan tea table. Not Japan in the geographical sense, but Japan lacquered. Scalloped edge, uh, pierced oriental frieze there, gilt, and the shaped legs. Just a bit unusual, isn't it? And of course, the two blacks, here they are, English blackamoors, not to be confused with the much later Venetian ones, which are usually full length or little slave boys, but here are these two kneeling blackamoors, shackled, shackled like that, and English, and still about this period, around about 1690, and jolly nice they are too. And, once more, back to my inventory. Here it says now, the last item in this room, a Delft flower pot in the chimney. Look at that, there it stands to this very day. Obviously with this strong Dutch influence, tulips. And that vase, that two-handled tulip vase would be known by that name the world over. People collected blue and white Delft, the queen herself collected it and it became very, very popular to decline a bit later on during the 18th century. You fancy that with all tulips falling out of it. And leaving the room, you can't help but notice the door furniture. Brasswork, the lock plates, the, the handle of the door, beautifully pierced and engraved, one might say, with the central motif of a tulip. Here's another room where the decoration on the walls have changed a bit. 
Because you see here, uh, even at this late date, about 1690, there they decorate the wall with a Mortlake tapestry. And, uh, of course, needlework. Everyone knows, I think, that such houses as this employed a professional embroiderer to teach the lady of the house and the female staff needlework. And so one is apt to find a number of needlework boxes or caskets such as that. But this one's a little different, you see, because there are all the usual attributes of stump needlework. This business of putting the needlework over wadding and so raising all the figures in sort of low relief. But this is where this one differs. Not only is it dated, that's nice, 1693 up the top there in silver wire. There's a portrait of William III under this awning. But look, everything is loose on this. There, the entrance to the awning, you see, oh, look at those colors. You can just imagine what this box was like in these colors when it was first made. And everything else is loose. You see this companion here, all the arms are loose. Every animal, the wings of every bird, the pears on the pear tree, all in 3D. So here's a 1693 example of needlework in 3D. Now what about these two chairs? Here they are, William and Mary, Charles II. Now you see, William and Mary chairs are known to have the tallest backs of any chair made. Two and a half times this distance is from the height of the chair to the ground. 16 inches there to 40 inches here, exactly right because I've measured it. But let's have a look at the two chairs because there's so little difference and yet there's such a lot of difference. You see, here we are, both in walnut, both with nice shaped arms, scroll here, a little bit more detail on the William and Mary one. Both have inverted S-shaped supports under the arms, just a little more molding on here. Down on the legs, exactly the same, inverted S-shaped legs, just the same, a little bit more molding, but the addition here of this capital, sometimes on the foot, sometimes on the top of the legs. Now you see, basically, these two chair frames are exactly the same, practically the same. Where does the difference come? It comes by the removal of this front stre central stretcher off the Charles chairs. They take away the rather stiff baluster turn stretchers underneath. They go. And you see what happens here on the William and Mary chair. No central stretcher, but look at those under stretchers. Not just crossed, X-shaped, but X-shaped in such a way that they have sort of raise up there and come round in that scroll, sort of leading one just to see that little turn finial. So there's only about 15 years difference here between this Charles chair and this William and Mary one. But you see what's gradually happening. We gradually get in some shapes and designs and getting away from those rather stiff chairs that went on through the earlier part of the 17th century.